going like that for years. A chicken or a duck here and there. Something bigger, only very rarely. It sounds absurd, but I almost came to think of it as commonplace. I only ever caught glimpses of the thing until what comes next. It terrified me. It happened in the middle of the day, over the course of a long weekend when my parents had gone to Seattle to see my uncle, who was ill. It was on a Saturday afternoon. I was 17 years old. I was out in the barn putting out food for the horses and the dogs. The horses were running around out in the pasture and the dogs were asleep in the corner of one of the horse stalls. I heard something rustling in the tall grass outside in the pasture. The dogs looked around a little bit but didn't seem to mind. I assumed it was just one of the horses waiting for me to leave so they could eat. I kept going about what I was doing and in several minutes I thought I heard breathing. I turned to look and it was standing in the door, tall as hell even hunched over. The sun was streaming in behind it, lighting up all the dust in the air around it like some kind of sickly halo. It was looking at me, considering me. Maybe it was trying to decide whether or not I was food. I remember swearing, turning and running as fast as I could for the house, not even thinking. Panic causing my legs to move. It was behind me, not even breathing hard. I heard its feet hitting the ground in a constant rhythm. I got to the house, opened the door, slammed it behind me, and I locked it as fast as I could. I tore through the house, locking every door and drawing the blinds on every window. I could hear it snarling outside the back door. The dogs were barking at it, but they wouldn't try to attack the thing. It was too big and they knew it. It roared at the dogs and they ran off, probably to hide in the pasture. I went to my parents' bedroom and got Dad's rifle. I loaded it, set up a chair in the living room facing the back door, and waited. It started prowling around the house. I could hear its feet crunching on the gravel of the driveway and the wooden planks of the back deck. It kept walking back and forth. I thought about trying to look through a window to see it, but I was too scared. Eventually, after hours of hoping it would go away, the sun went down. I turned on all of the outside lights and went up to my room. I opened my window with the rifle in my hands, hoping to be able to pick the thing off from above. I saw it lurking just beyond the glow from the porch light. It had long, sinewy arms and walked on bent knee. It was by the chicken coop, then it disappeared from view. I heard the chicken squawking and screeching. The thing reappeared with a dead, bloody chicken in its hands. It bit off one of the wings with jaws that were dripping with slime and drool and let the dead bird drop to the ground at its feet. Then it looked at me. Its eyes made contact with my eyes. It turned away again, back to the chickens. It came back with another bird, mutilated it in front of me, and dropped it. It went back again, and again. I should have taken a shot at it, but I was astounded and confused, trying to figure out what it was doing. Then it hit me. It was a show of power. It was showing me that it was stronger than me. That it could do whatever it wanted to do because I couldn't stop it. At the same time, I felt powerless and sickened. Powerless because what it was saying was true. If it was just that thing and me, I wouldn't stand a chance. Sickened because I realized what kind of intelligence it would need to be able to convey that message. The thought shook me out of my stupor and I remembered the rifle at my side. It was heading back to the chickens and I decided that when it came back, I would take my shot. It strode back to the porch, 
almost arrogant, walking on bended knee with those arms so long that that chicken was nearly dragging on the ground. I raised the rifle up to my eye and tried to steady myself. My heart was beating so hard I could see the rifle shaking ever so slightly in rhythm with each heartbeat I could hear pounding in my own ears. It raised the body to its mouth, and just as it was about to put the chicken's head inside, I squeezed the trigger. The crack of the gun echoed in the now shattered quiet of the nighttime standoff, and I heard it howl. A painful, loud, startled howl. I had hit it on the outside of the shoulder. It ran off into the night. I never saw it again. It was still out there, though. It still killed chickens and other things, more often than before. I'm writing all of this now because my parents died three weeks ago. They were killed in a collision with a drunk driver. He survived. They left me the farm and I intend to live here with my own family. I'm 32 now and I work for an Oregon Fish and Game office in Salem. I'm married to a wonderful woman named Stephanie. We have one son, Zachary, who is four years old. We are expecting a daughter in four months. I've come to the farmhouse alone today. I told Steph I just wanted some time alone in my parents' house to deal with some emotions. She was very understanding. I've come back to claim what is rightfully mine. I have Dad's rifle next to me on the table and it's almost dusk. I've also brought several portable halogen lights to set up around the house and my own shotgun. I'm borrowing a handgun from Joe, a guy at Fish and Game who I work with. When I am done typing this account of my memories, I will print it out and leave it on the dining room table along with my wedding ring and my key to the safe deposit box where my will is kept. Everything is loaded and ready. Hopefully I will return here to collect these things and nobody will ever know I wrote this. Steph, in the event that you are the unfortunate soul to find this, which I'm terrified to think seems a likely outcome, The thought of you having to go on alone hurts me more than anything in this world ever can. Know that I love you more than anything, and I hope you understand that I am doing this to keep you safe. Zachary, I love you and can only hope you grow up to be a good, kind-hearted and strong man like your grandfather was. To my unborn daughter... If I don't live long enough to meet you, it will be the single greatest regret of my life. Tell the police. Tell Fish and Game. Call Joe. He's one of the few people who knows about this. Make this situation known. Eventually someone will kill it, even if it isn't me. Goodbye for now. Our sleepless tales have come to an end. Close your eyes, drift off, and don't look under the bed. The No Sleep Podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons license, 2011. Some rights reserved. No Sleep.